Good day. Uh, my name is Dennis DeLugos. I'm a child neurologist and a pediatric epilepsy specialist at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and the University of Pennsylvania. This talk will serve as an update of uh, clinical trials in Dravet syndrome. And let's just say that there's a lot going on with clinical trials in Dravet syndrome these days. It will be more of a general overview of the trial process and with a few details about individual trials, but I won't have time to go into great detail on any of the specific trials that are underway. These are my research disclosures. And here's our roadmap for the talk. So first we'll talk about the very complicated, cumbersome and sometimes frustrating clinical trials process. Then we'll dive in in a little bit of detail to the current Dravet trials that are underway. And then we'll talk about participant selection for trials. Cause I know many of your, uh, your family members uh, have either been participants in past trials or might be looking to be participants. So this has very uh, personal import for you about how patients are actually selected for trials. So why is the clinical trials process so complicated? Well, to be blunt, the history of medicine is not entirely positive when it comes to treatments. There is a long history of treatments in medicine, largely before the Food and Drug Administration was formed, where treatments were marketed that were not necessarily safe uh, or well tolerated or effective, but were marketed as such. And rigorous clinical trials help in part to avoid such an outcome. That said, clinical trials can be rather harsh and cold sometimes because a lot of clinical trials have to do with counting, with measuring things. These first two quotes are sort of the positive side of counting things. Science begins with counting. If you can't measure it, you can't improve it. But Albert Einstein uh, provides a more holistic view. Everything that can be counted does not necessarily count. And everything that counts cannot necessarily be counted. So we have to balance these two views, that we need to be able to measure things to improve them. But we know that any clinical trial with its primary and secondary outcomes will not capture the whole spectrum of a medical condition. There are important differences between uh, approving treatments in the US versus Europe. To oversimplify, but to make an important point, in the US via the Food and Drug Administration, a new treatment must show it's better than something. That something can be a placebo or that something could be another treatment. But the key in the US is to show superiority. In Europe, for some types of treatments, it is possible to gain an approval if your new treatment is not worse than an existing treatment. Uh, sometimes the word equivalence is used if your new treatment is equivalent to an existing treatment, uh, but that's not technically accurate. The, the better term is your new treatment is not inferior or not worse than an existing treatment. We're going to focus this talk on the US process which requires superiority of a new treatment over something. So why does the FDA insist on superiority? So let me briefly explain this graph that might explain part of why the FDA feels strongly about new treatments showing superiority over something. In the bottom left part of this curve, imagine a group of patients with, very, with a very severe condition where current treatments in the, in, the hash, in the hatched line or new treatments in the solid line are not likely to make a difference, unfortunately. And then in the upper right, patients with a mild condition where standard treatments or new treatments are both likely to help because the condition is so mild. On both ends of these spectrums, you can manipulate the inclusion criteria of your trial to help your new treatment look not inferior. If nothing works or if everything works, 
you are a step ahead in showing your new treatment being not inferior to current treatments. The FDA is looking for this sweet spot here for patients that do show a difference in something between a new treatment and a standard treatment. So it is more rigorous for sure, but uh, it can avoid some of the um, biases in trial design that can make uh, non-inferiority trials perhaps simpler. But regardless of what we think about superiority versus non-inferiority trials, the FDA is looking for superiority in a new treatment. So there are tomes of FDA regulations, <clears throat> and I'm going to summarize them in basically one slide, which is here. So the typical road to an FDA approval for a medication starts with what are called phase one studies, which are typically done in healthy volunteers. So patients without the disease, and they are given the investigational uh, treatment and uh, studies of safety, tolerability, and dosing are performed. Essentially, how much of this new treatment can a healthy volunteer tolerate before they uh, report some side effects? Then in phase two studies, patients are studied for the first time, again with attention to dosing, safety, tolerability, and perhaps an initial look at efficacy or does is the treatment effective? Now, there are vast uh, uh, differences in the many types of phase two studies. Some actually have a comparison group uh, where you're actually comparing the new treatment to an existing treatment or a placebo. Others do not. Uh, for rare diseases, phase two studies can be a critical part of the ultimate application package for the treatment to be approved. Then there are phase three studies that take a more rigorous look at efficacy, uh, does the treatment work, and again, looks at safety, tolerability, and sometimes other treatment outcomes, and we'll talk later on about non-seizure outcomes in Dravet syndrome. And phase three studies in the U.S. will always have a control group or a comparison group because that's required. Now, sometimes these studies are blurred. You will see phase one slash two studies or phase two slash three studies, but this is the general road to an FDA approval. And this approval process has been quite successful for treatments of Dravet syndrome. Uh, there are now three uh, FDA approved treatments uh, that are displayed here. And all of these treatments went through that FDA uh, approval process. And great strides have been made in the treatment of Dravet syndrome in terms of reducing seizures for many patients. But as you all know, we have a long way to go and there's a lot of unfinished business with Dravet syndrome clinical trials. So now let's move on to the second part of the talk and we'll do a, a brief overview of the current Dravet clinical trials. These trials fall into three types, three very different types of studies. The first are looking at oral medications, so medications taken by mouth versus a placebo. And these studies are not that different from the studies done a few years ago, some of you participated in, thank you again for your participation, that led to the approval of the treatments listed on the previous slide. And we'll talk about them in a, in a slide or two. Then there are two natural history studies underway, which are not treatment trials. There is no intervention. They're trying to help us learn more about Dravet syndrome. And then there is one precision therapy trial that has begun and another that is uh, in the planning stage and has a natural history study underway that will link to it. So we'll go through uh, each of these types of studies in a general way. So the first group of studies are the oral medications, investigational medications, compared to placebo. And these trials will look pretty similar to the recent uh, studies of Dravet syndrome because nothing succeeds like success. And uh, if a trial methodology leads to uh, positive trials and a regulatory approval, uh, future studies will try to mimic parts of that trial when that makes sense. So the three studies underway right now of oral medications for Dravet syndrome are Clemazole, 
lorcasserin, and soticlostat. You see the age ranges of the trials. Uh, note that the minimum age for all of them is two years, uh, and they have various upper age limits. And all of them will involve a screening phase where eligibility is confirmed, and then a baseline phase where seizures are counted and other baseline measures are made, then randomization between the investigational treatment and placebo, and then a, uh, a treatment phase or an assessment phase. <clears throat> and these, like I said, are built on the standard uh, medication investigational trial design, uh, and uh, we'll see how they turn out. And um, the next type of studies are natural history studies. There are two underway right now. One is enrolling patients between two and 18 years of age. The other is enrolling patients between six months and five years of age. And as I said a minute ago, these are not interventional studies. These studies are tracking or measuring at baseline and then at periodic, periodic intervals over roughly two years, <clears throat> development, IQ, adaptive behavior, quality of life, sleep, walking, seizures, and other measures in uh, patients with Dravet syndrome. So why are these studies being done? I think there's a lot of confusion about why natural history studies are being performed. One view is that these natural history studies will, will then allow future precision medicine treatments to be approved without a control group, without a comparison group, that this natural history data will serve as the control group. Honestly, I think that is very unlikely. The reason why I think these natural history studies are being performed is to try to identify similarities between patients with Dravet syndrome that can be measured in precision therapy clinical trials. We know a lot about Dravet syndrome, but one of the hallmarks of Dravet syndrome among hundreds of patients is patients are different. They follow different disease courses, different seizure types at times, different developmental trajectories, and differences, sometimes called heterogeneity, in a clinical trial is a problem. The more heterogeneity genius, the more different the patients are, the more challenging it can be to show something is getting better. So if there are certain characteristics within patients with Dravet syndrome that are similar, that will be very helpful in informing what can be measured in the upcoming precision therapy clinical trials. Maybe it's a certain age group where something typically happens, a certain seizure type, a certain seizure frequency, a certain developmental uh, milestone that is reached or is not reached. So similarities or homogeneity as opposed to heterogeneity is very important in trial design. And these natural history studies are trying to improve our understanding of what might be similar among patient groups uh, in Dravet syndrome. That is completely my opinion. Um, there are different views on the value of natural history studies, but that's, I think, is an honest way uh, to justify why these studies are happening. And then there are the precision therapy trials, which are very exciting, uh, landmarks, in fact, in epilepsy treatment. One is in progress already. Uh, it uses a technique called RNA regulation therapy. And in the next two slides, we'll do a little bit of molecular biology to explain why this treatment approach uh, will work. Uh, this study is in progress already. Uh, the, the broad age range is two to 18 years. Right now, the study uh, <clears throat> is looking, has looked at patients who received a single dose of this RNA regulation therapy, and it's moving on to patients receiving multiple doses. Uh, the key to this study is to look at safety, 
tolerability <clears throat> and what's called pharmacokinetics. Uh, think of that uh, in simplified ways like blood levels, except this treatment is delivered into the cerebral spinal fluid via a spinal tap or lumbar puncture. So it is measuring various things in the blood and in the spinal fluid. <clears throat> and once this dosing safety tolerability study is done, then an efficacy trial will follow uh, to assess whether the treatment uh, works. Uh, again, uh, following the FDA requirement to show superiority over something. So what's the science behind this RNA regulation therapy? So here's the, the first of a couple molecular biology slides. So to simplify here, this double helix is DNA, two copies of the SCN1A gene, and then there is what's called RNA, and then there's the protein over here. So ultimately, the purpose of the SCN1A gene is to generate a protein that helps regulate how neurons work. And the problem with Dr Dravet syndrome is one of the copies of the SCN1A gene is abnormal and does not generate any functional protein. The other copy is normal, but in all of us, the way the SCN1A gene is designed, half of the potential protein from the normal copy of the SCN1A gene is destroyed naturally. So DNA becomes RNA, and then in the splicing of this RNA, half of it is destroyed naturally in all of us. So then half of the potential protein of the good copy of the gene is actually made. So once that was understood, a compound called an ASO or an antisense anti oligonucleotide was developed to not act at all on the abnormal copy of the SC SCN1A uh, gene product, but to impact the normal copy uh, of the SN SCN SCN1A gene, the normal, what's called a pre-messenger RNA, to trick it into making 100% of the protein. So without the ASO, which acts as this green arrow, this RNA molecule would be destroyed and then there would be no protein made. But if the ASO blocks the destruction of that, then you make more protein. And the hope is that that will have clinically significant benefits in patients with Dravet syndrome. The reason why this is called precision therapy is this won't work uh, this ASO won't work for any other type of epilepsy. There may be other ASOs could, that could be developed for different types of epilepsy, but this particular ASO treatment is precise for Dravet syndrome. So that's the quick review of the science behind the trial. Now, the ultimate trial will be complicated, and uh, it will be very important that uh, optimal things are measured, hence the need for the natural history study to try to find the most measurable things that can uh, hopefully show uh, efficacy uh, in the future trial of this uh, RNA regulation therapy. The other precision trial, uh, which is the actual trial itself is still in the planning stage. No human has been dosed with this treatment yet but the natural history study is underway. This is the natural history study that is enrolling patients from six months to five years. And this uses a different technique called DNA regulation therapy. So another molecular biology slide. So it's a DNA RNA protein. So the DNA regulation therapy strategy uh, is designed to upregulate or encourage the regulatory region of the healthy copy of the SCN1A gene to make more protein. It's a, the, the end result is designed to be similar. You make more protein with this approach, just like the prior method. It doesn't work on the mutated uh, gene copy, uh, but it is designed to boost the, the RNA and protein production of the healthy uh, gene copy. 
so this study it also has uh, their natural history study, which is currently enrolling from six months to uh, five years of age. So that's a lot of exciting developments in Dravet syndrome. Obviously, the trials have to uh, work out and be safe, well-tolerated, and effective, but it's an exciting time for Dravet syndrome research and for pediatric epilepsy research in general. So how are patients or participants selected for these trials? The reality is that not every family or patient who is interested will end up being eligible, and that is true for any clinical trial. There are lots of rules. Some of the things to think about uh, in general, this is not unique to any of the individual trials, but these are some of the questions regarding patient selection. And this will cover all types of trials from the oral medications to the natural history studies to the precision medicine trials. So is the clinical diagnosis of Dervais syndrome accurate? In other words, uh, patients may be labeled as having Dravet syndrome, but do they in fact meet the clinical inclusion criteria for Dravet used by the study? Is an SCN1A mutation required? In the past studies that led to the current FDA approvals, a clinical diagnosis was enough. SCN1A, an SCN1A mutation was not required for some of the current trials, and for both of the precision medicine trials, a pathogenic SCN1A mutation will be required. Are the seizures that are reported as seizures actually seizures, or are they something else? And can those seizures be reliably counted? And do they occur at regular intervals? Uh, the more regular, the more homogeneous, the more predictable seizures are, the more favorable they are for any clinical trial. Now, we know that no patient is exactly regular in their seizures, but um, the more regular the seizure frequency, the more favorable the patient is for any clinical trial. These are some rough uh, broad strokes of a clinical diagnosis of Dravet syndrome. I think the audience, you're very familiar with this. Um, most patients, their first seizure occurs between three and 15 months of age. There are certain initial seizures, then other seizures emerge. One of the hallmarks of Dravet syndrome is that early development is typical and then it slows down. And uh, 70 to 80% of patients with clinical Dravet syndrome have an SCN1A mutation, but not every patient with clinical Dravet syndrome has an SCN1A mutation. And every trial has um, many, many more criteria than this, but these are uh, sort of standard Dravet syndrome clinical diagnostic criteria. Certain seizures are more important in clinical trials than others. This is a study that's about 12 years old now that looked at seizures recorded in an epilepsy monitoring unit that were confirmed to be seizures by video EEG compared to parent report. And no surprise, tonic-clonic seizures and atonic or tonic seizures, so drop seizures, were very reliably and accurately reported by parents. Focal seizures were less so, although focal motor seizures are more reliably uh, tracked uh, by uh, observers. And then myoclonic seizures and, and absence seizures are very difficult to count precisely. So in most or all of the Dervais syndrome trials, the, what are called the primary outcome seizures uh, are the convulsive seizures, which are tonic-clonic seizures, focal motor seizures, and sometimes drop seizures. So certain seizure types uh, are viewed differently uh, in clinical trials because they're easier to count and identify. There are some red flags uh, where patients that have been clinically diagnosed as Dravet syndrome might not meet criteria for Dravet syndrome clinical trials. If their development was never typical, if their seizure started too early or too late, if they have a single seizure type, except that there are patients whose only seizure types are hemiclonic or generalized tonic-clonic, uh, that's an exception, but most patients with Dravet have more than one seizure type. If they have unusual seizure types that start before the first birthday, infantile spasms at any point, and abnormal MRI scans. 
These are, depending on the trial criteria, either uh, cautionary flags or red flags, stop signs for in, enrollment. Uh, and each study has its own rules that they have to carefully adhere to. Some unique challenges with studying uh, seizures in Dravet syndrome is that some patients have infrequent prolonged seizures. As I said before, uh, more regular seizures are e more easily counted in clinical trials. So variable seizure flurries uh, are a challenge, difficult to count seizures. If your only seizures are myoclonic and absence, that is uh, challenging for enrollment in a trial. And then there's this annoying baseline phase when you're in the study, you've been screened, but nothing's happening because seizures are being counted. The length of that phase uh, is a challenge. Uh, we all want it to be as short as possible, but uh, sometimes too short of a baseline phase can cause trouble for actually showing a difference down the road. Uh, so every trial has to negotiate the length of the baseline phase. Another source of frustration for sites and for families and participants. <coughs> Challenges in any clinical trial for epilepsy are when non-seizure events are called seizures. Uh, that's, a, that's one way to ha have a negative study at the end. If seizures are missed, if there's inconsistent counting during the baseline phase or the treatment phase, we talked about the length of the baseline phase being a challenge. The placebo response is mysterious. Almost every trial has a placebo response. We don't understand it but uh, we are trying trial, trial design experts and sponsors, sites always uh, uh, try to minimize the placebo response rate uh, because that can hurt a, a new product from showing that it actually works. And of course, in the end, the investigational treatments need to be safe, well-tolerated and effective. So we have a long, we have a lot of work to do, but uh, a, a lot of progress has been made with Dravet syndrome and hopefully more to come. So just some future opportunities, and they're really current opportunities because these have been built in whenever possible to the current trials. Uh, we need to try to understand why the placebo effect happens and try to reduce it to keep the placebo arm as short as possible. Lots of attention to non-seizure outcomes. I know that has been very clear in this meeting in the past. The natural history studies are largely about non-seizure outcomes, and those metrics will hopefully be built into future efficacy trials. And then recognition of the burden of trials, study visits, study procedures on patient and caregivers. That message was also received loud and clear in recent years, and hopefully that is reflected when possible in the current trial designs. So that's it. Uh, and thank you very much to uh, the Dravet community, uh, the patients, the families, the care providers, all of the stakeholders that have helped facilitate our progress to date in Dravet, and hopefully will be partners with us as we make more progress, much needed progress uh, in the future. Thank you very much.